Okay, could, tonight I'm going to go over some developmental milestones from birth to five to six years of age. How many of you here have children in the preschool age, or in the birth to five? How about older than birth to five? Okay. Um, so if you have questions about the older children, you can ask me about that a little bit later. These are just guidelines to go by as you're looking at the milestones that we would expect children to achieve at different age levels. There are a variety of different checklists that will tell you a child may do one skill at a certain age, and then another checklist may say, oh, six months earlier or six months later. And a lot of that is because one checklist may be looking to say, well, this child has done this once, okay, we'll check it off. Or is this something that your child can do? They do it 25 times every day. They do it at home. They do it when they're in an unfamiliar environment. So you have to kind of look at the milestones and consider it could go six months one way or the other. Um, other things to take into consideration are that girls usually advance faster in their communication skills than boys do. Birth order can sometimes make a difference because we will reinforce sounds that the first child makes a little bit more. Everybody will get real excited and clap and then further on down we repeat the sound that the ch that child makes, but we would be less likely to um, reinforce that sound. Um, we're going to talk about what both receptive communication skills, which is what your child understands, and expressive communication skills, which is what your child says or communicates with gestures. So we'll start out with between birth and six months. Babies already start understanding a lot of what's going on in their environment. They start reacting to the sounds that they hear, and they'll turn their head to try to locate that sound. They'll glance at someone when they are speaking to them. And they'll start to show anticipation of familiar routines and activities. So um, you're ready to give them a bath and they go in the bathroom and you start your routine, they might start tensing up their body, moving their arms and legs, letting you know they know what's coming next. Um, when they see a bottle, they'll open their mouth. They begin to notice when they hear a familiar sound and then all of a sudden there's a change to an unfamiliar sound. So they might now not be turning their head to familiar sounds, but then when you introduce something that they haven't heard before, they will turn their head to look for that sound. And if at any time you suspect that your child's having a hard time hearing, they just don't seem to be reacting to sounds, they're never too young to take them to an audiologist to have their hearing tested. They don't need to be old enough to do behavioral audiometry where they point to one ear and the other ear. There are tools that the audiologist can use to evaluate your child's hearing before they can respond. So that'd be something to talk to your physician about if that is something you get concerned about. Um, between birth and six months, children start their expressive communication. They may not be intentionally communicating some of these things that you see, but they are doing them, and it communicates something to you. So you can tell when they're crying if they're angry, if they're tired, if they're scared, if they're hungry. They aren't maybe intentionally crying in a certain way to tell you that, but but they are telling you that. Um, they're vocalizing a variety of sounds in the back of their throat. They might not necessarily be speech sounds, but they are sounds. They start to smile when they're spoken to, and when you hear them in the crib, making noises, they'll vary their pitch and their volume. They'll make pleasurable sounds and displeasurable sounds. And that isn't necessarily to communicate something to you, but you can tell if they're happy or not. Um, they'll usually begin to make some speech sounds towards six months of age, um, maybe one consonant sound and one vowel. 
The earliest, earliest developing consonant sounds are usually P, B and M. Sometimes you might hear a G or a D or a P. The reason that B and M are the easiest sounds are they're made with your lips. They're easier that way. And um, if you take two sounds like B and P, the B is a sound that's produced when your vocal cords are vibrating, and that's easier for the kids. So if you put your hand by your throat and say, B, you'll feel your vo vocal cords vibrate. If you then say, P, you'll be able to tell that they don't. Then if you put your hand in front of your mouth and produce the B, you won't feel much air. But if you produce a P, you'll feel a puff of air. So P is a little harder. The vocal cords aren't vibrating, and you have to build up more pressure inside your mouth before that sound is produced. At 6 to 12 months of age, children are able to react to loud voices, friendly voices. They can tell if somebody's angry. They might start crying when they hear an angry voice. They start to not just smile when they hear someone speaking to them, but they show interest in the speech and they are listening. They start to be able to understand a few simple directions in context. So if, you, if they're holding a block and you hold it out and say, give it to me, they will give it to you. Um, if you're changing their clothes and you say, put your arms up, they'll lift their arms for up. They start to be able to point out some body parts. They're usually facial body parts to start with, a nose, a mouth. Um, they'll start to be able to look for people or objects when they're named. So if you say, where's daddy? They'll look around until they see daddy. Um, you probably don't even realize that you're teaching that, but as maybe every time daddy comes home, you say, daddy's home, daddy's home, and then pretty soon they start to make that association. Or if you say, where's your ball? They'll look around and they'll keep looking at different toys until they see the ball, and then they'll fix their gaze on the ball, and you know that they understood that word. Where is the ball? Oh, do I keep forgetting to move forward? No. Okay. Um, expressively, between 6 and 12 months, they're making significant gains in their abilities. They start to make non-speech sounds such as laughing, gurgling, a tongue click, kind of a <coughs> or they'll blow raspberries. Now they're going to start babbling some consonant vowel combinations in, into syllables. So you might hear things like ba ba, mama, da da, ga ga. Some children will start varying their consonant and vowel productions too, so that you will hear two different consonants or different vowels within the same syllable string. They start to play interactive games like peekaboo. And that prepares them for the turn taking that's going to go on in conversation when they get a little bit older and are able to talk with you. It also teaches them imitation, which is important when they're going to learn how to imitate sounds that you make. So first, it's much easier to learn to clap your hands or put your hands in front of your face than to imitate a single sound. So. Um, those are important games to play with your child. They're teaching a lot in the communication area. And um, they may be, by 12 months, able to say uh, two or three true words. And when we say true words, we mean that they are words to the child, even though they might not be understandable words to anybody else. They may have made up their own word for something, um, that kind of thing. But um, all children don't have a words right at 12 months, but some of them do. For understanding between 12 and 18 months, they start to understand some commands like stop, wait, and no. They may not stop, but they'll hesitate, look at you, and maybe try to do it again and see if you'll um, say no again, but they indicate that they understand what you said. They start to be able to follow some directions with the object in sight. So if you have a couple things laying on the table and you say, put the apple in the sack, 
and there's an apple and a banana right there next to them, they would pick up the apple and put it in the sack. They recognize their own name, and they'll um, look towards you. Now they're able to point out more body parts. They might start adding body parts like foot and tummy, and they can show you where some of their clothing items are. Show me your shoes, your shirt, or your hat. They can answer, answer some simple questions. Things like, what's that? Who's that? They're probably not able to answer more complex questions. Um, if you would have a book and you would show them um, a dog and say, is that a cat? We probably wouldn't expect them to be able to say no, because that's a lot to process a whole question like that. But they can answer, who's that, what's that, and name the object. Expressively by this point, um, children are using more consonant sounds. They might even bring in sounds like K, H, and W. And their words are becoming easier to understand. So at first, a word for bottle might be ba ba, because they're using the same consonant twice and the same vowel twice. And then it will advance to being a little bit better understood to ba bo, where they're using the, the same consonant twice, but they're changing the vowel to become, sound a little bit more like the real word. And then to ba do, um, they're changing, now they have two different consonants and two different vowels. But it still isn't completely a correct word. They don't have the L, they don't have the T, but it's easy for you to understand. And uh, familiar listeners are able to understand a lot of their words by this point. They're adding rapidly to their vocabulary, and they might start using some two-word phrases. And those phrases can be in two different types. Either a two-word phrase that conveys one meaning, thank you, bye-bye, all gone. They aren't conveying two different meanings and putting them together to make a two-word phrase for those. But if they would say, mommy shoe, then they're putting together two different thoughts to create a phrase. They're saying, that's mom's shoe. And um, that indicates that they're getting the idea of creating sentences. They'll start using their words to make requests, not just to label items. So at first, you'll hear mostly nouns, and they'll be just they'll be walking around labeling the things that they see. So they see a cookie and they'll say cookie. And by now they might be hungry for a cookie and say cookie. They're requesting that you get it for them. By 18 to 24 months, they have expand their understanding of words from 50 to 300. So they're understanding a lot of words. They're learning new words every day. And now they're starting to be able to understand more than just nouns, but some action words, um, maybe even some concept words like in and out. Um, so if, if you're looking at a book and you say, show me who's sleeping, they'll be able to point, or show me who's eating or crying, instead of just show me the cat, the dog, the boy. Um, they're able to point out objects and family members when they are named. They're able to follow directions, often for objects that are out of sight. So if you're in one room and you ask them to go to their room, go get your diaper, even though they can't see the diaper, they know what you mean and they can go and get it. Expressively, between a year and a half and two years of age, familiar listeners are able to understand much of what is said, and unfamiliar mm -hmm. listeners understand some of what is said. Um, words are beginning to have beginning and ending sounds that are more clear-cut. So before, when they were 
saying ba ba, there was not a consonant sound that would follow a vowel. Those were a consonant and a vowel together, and they might combine those into two syllable words, but they weren't getting an ending sound on the word. Sometimes with those syllables, it also might be um, a, like for apple, they'll say ap o. So they got a consonant sound on the end and a vowel at the beginning, but it wasn't a consonant, a vowel, and another consonant. But now they're starting to do that. And um, they might make some substitutions for their some of the consonants. So instead of cup, they may say tup, but they're getting a beginning and ending sound. Um, they may say moom for moon. They're moving the sound from the beginning of the word and using it again at the end of the word. But they are using sound. And at this point, they're using 100 to 200 words. They're starting to use verbs. They're starting to use some descriptive words. And um, you might hear a pronoun like mine. They start using more two-word phrases. And these are more phrases that combine a noun and a verb, um, a noun and a descriptive word. You'll hear them talking to themselves during play. They're playing with a ball. They might say ball, big ball. They're practicing their language while they're playing. And they're using some environmental sounds. They'll make uh, a car motor sound or animal sounds while they're playing. Between two and three years, their understanding of language continues to improve. They're able to listen to stories and point to pictures of objects by their use or by parts of the objects. So now, um, first they could point to bike. Now you can say, point to the one you ride, and they would be able to point to the bike. Or not just point to the dog, but they can point to the dog's nose. So if you have a dog, a cat, and a bunny on the page, you can say, show me the dog's nose and they can understand both of those words together and point out the object. They understand negative words more than just no. They understand words like can't and don't. And they're understanding even more pronouns. This one's mine, that one's yours. They are understanding the beginning of concept words, in, off, out, big, wet, in, on, under, out, off. Those are some of the very beginning concept words that kids will learn. Um, babies will do a lot of putting things in a container and taking them out, and so they're hearing those kinds of words from you a lot, and that's how they begin to understand it. They start to understand the names of familiar places. We're going to grandma's house. We're going to school, church, McDonald's. They'll understand when you tell them that where they're going. expressively between two and three words, more difficult sounds are coming into their repertoire of sounds. Um, they might start using sounds like F, which is a little harder. You have to put your teeth on your lip and then blow. Um, sometimes kids will substitute a P, a P sound for the F, and that's part of a normal sequence of development. Um, but they're beginning to get that F sound now between two and three. They're using more sounds and combining these into three-syllable words. And their vocabulary increases greatly. So um, they're not just saying nana now, but they might actually be able to say banana, get all three words. They start using some word endings, ing on the end of verbs. So instead of saying boy eat, they'll now say boy eating. And they'll start to put a plural in on word books and um, possessives. It's the dog's food. They combine three to four words and phrases. And this is wrong. They are using more pronouns, but you might start hearing um, the beginning of other pronouns besides 
me and mine. They might start to use pronouns like he and she. They start to ask what and where questions, and they might all also ask some who questions. Questions seem to kind of come in clumps. First, they'll ask what, where, and who questions. And a little bit when they get to be a little bit older, and we'll talk about this, then they get into the why, when, and how questions. So they'll ask, what's that? Where's mom? Where's my shoe? And they start to be able to carry on a conversation so that they say something to you, they listen to your answer, and they respond to what you've said and go back and forth in conversation. For what they're understanding, um, between three and four years of age, they start to be able to understand complex sentences and not only understand them, but make some inferences from those. So um, if you're reading a book and you say, it was a rainy day, and you might not actually see the character out in the rain, but now they're sitting in a chair in the house, but they're all wet, and they'll understand that they were out in the rain, they came in, and that's why they're wet. They start to understand some quantity concept words, things like many, one, and all. They understand that um, when you say he, you're referring to a boy, she to a girl. When it's his coat, it belongs to a boy. And they're starting to understand some category <coughs> words, um, things like clothes, toys, animals, and foods. So. Um, you don't need to name the specific food. You can just say it's food. Or um, instead of naming dog, cat, lion, tiger, you can say animals, and they'll understand what you mean. Uh, expressively, now some even more difficult sounds are coming in, things like ya yeah in yellow, uh, a th sound you might hear. You might start to hear some consonant blends things like spoon, where they would get both of those sounds. You, the sounds might not be real clear cut, and they might make a few errors on those sounds. Um, their tongue might be a little bit forward for the S, that kind of thing, but they're putting two consonants together. Um, and then abutting consonants are two sounds that come together like the ND and sand. They might start to get both of those, or the N and the D in window. They aren't really a consonant blend, but they're two consonants that are next to each other in a word. They're using several words in a sentence, and their sentences are starting to become more grammatically correct. They can tell you how an object is used. So if you say, what do you do with soap? They can tell you that you wash your hands with it. You say, what do you do with a spoon? They can answer, eat. They're using more word endings, so now, um, the past tense ed comes in. Um, not just boy jump, but now it might be he jumped, and you hear that T. Uh, you'll hear an ER, um, painter, drummer, skater. And um, they're able to answer some questions logically. So you can say, um, the soup is hot. What should we do? And then they know. They can say, oh, we'll blow on it, or it's cold. What do we need? We need a coat. They're able to use words to describe their physical state. So when they're hungry, they're able to say hungry instead of just eat. Or when they want something to drink, they can say thirsty. By four to five years of age, their auditory memory, what they can process and remember, is getting much better, and they can follow up to three-step directions. Go to your room, bring them, go to your room, get your shoes, bring them to the steps and put them on. They're able to understand some simple stories and can answer easy questions about the stories. Um, after you are reading the story, you can say, what did the puppy eat? And they can tell you he ate a bone. They understand more concepts for location. They start to understand words like behind, in front, and beside, and words for quality, things like tall, short, and long. They start to be able to understand words about time. 
They understand tomorrow, today, yesterday. We aren't going today, but we'll go tomorrow. They understand more complex and expanded sentences. If you're good, we'll stop for ice cream. Or um, you're looking at a book and you say, find the little black kitty in the box. And there might be several kitties. And that's a lot to remember and process, the little black kitty. So they've come a long ways in what they can remember and process in a short time. They understand an object by description. If you say, it's the one that's round and it bounces, they can tell you that it's the ball. Or it's the animal that lives on a farm and he gives us milk. They know it's the cow. Okay, between four and five years of age, you hear more sounds used correctly more frequently and in harder words. There are sounds like, and if you'll, on the, you guys have a handout about um, the uh, development of speech sounds, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but you'll see on there that there are sounds like S that come in significantly later. Well. They're usually used by the kids. When um, you look at a guideline like that, it means that they expect that the child is using that sound correctly in all positions of words and completely correctly. So they're not putting their tongue forward and with that S sound, but they're actually able to produce it correctly. Where here at four to five, we expect that they're using that sound. It might just be a little bit distorted. They're using an R sound. It might not be completely correct, but they're using it. It might be a little bit distorted. Um, TH might be correct some of the time, and then some of the time you might hear an F for a TH. But familiar listeners understand almost everything that the child is saying. They have a vocabulary of around 1,500 words, and now they're asking you why all the time. And they don't necessarily listen to the answer. They're just practicing their ability to ask those kinds of questions. So they'll ask you why, and you'll give them an answer, and they'll ask you why, and they'll give you, you'll give them an answer, and they'll ask you why some more. Um, their sentences are becoming more grammatically correct with the use of the pronouns. And um, the use of future verb trends will come in. So they'll use a word like will, he will eat. They're able to tell you a short story in sequence, you know, two or three things that happened in a story. And they start using some abstract words like I wish and he might. Oh, and I wanted to mention back on the um, pronouns of he and she, a lot of times you'll hear a child um, say him for he or her for she. And that that's a normal sequence in the development. And as long as that doesn't la persist for a long time, that isn't really anything to be too concerned about. So if you hear your child say, him is eating, you can say, you're right, he is eating. And when they hear you say it correctly, they should start to pick up on that. If they don't at a certain point, then that's when you come see us. Uh, what they understand between five and six, okay, now we're starting to get to the point where they're not only learning language, but they're learning language so that they can um, use it to learn in school. So they understand more concept words, things like near and far, a pair is two, and they start to understand the relationships between those concepts. So they understand that big and little are opposites of each other, and little and small mean the same thing. And those are things that usually are part of the language arts curriculum in kindergarten. They understand more complex sentences. Things like the cat was chased up the tree by the dog. A younger child would hear that and they would hear cat, chased, and dog, and they would think that the cat had chased the dog. But older children are able to process the entire sentence and the grammatical formulation of that sentence, and so they understand that it was actually that that the cat was the one that was actually chased, not doing the chasing. They begin to understand some phonetic relationships of words, words that rhyme, words that begin with the same sound, and again, those are in the curriculum in kindergarten, and um, those are things that are going to help with pre-reading skills. 
There are a lot of books that you can read to your children that um, have those kinds of things. Dr. Seuss books have a lot of rhymes. Um, Hop on Pop, uh, Green Eggs and Ham are a couple of them that have a lot of rhyming words. They begin to understand the relationship between objects and items that do not belong together in a category. So previously they learned what categories were. Now they understand that if you have an apple, a banana, an orange, and a shoe, which one is not a food? And those are the kinds of things that you'll see them working on in their language arts curriculum too. Expressively, by this point, their speech should be pretty much understandable to everyone who's listening to them. Use of the more difficult sounds, SH, CH, TH, L, become more accurate. And you hear the consonant blends. So um, they might have said flower for flower previously. Now they're getting the F and the L together in there. Uh, their sentences are five to six words in length and grammatically correct, with the exception of some of the later developing grammatical skills, like irregular past tense, um, eight, instead of, you might hear eated. And sometimes you will hear your children use irregular past tense correctly, he ate, and then as they are learning the rules of language and they learn that ed past tense ED goes with past tense. Now you'll hear EDID or ATID. They'll start putting an ED past tense marker on the irregular verbs. Well, it's not that they learned that verb to begin with. If they're repeating what they heard. And then now that they're learning the rules of language, they start putting those word markers on. So that really isn't them going backwards. That's They're going forwards. And that isn't anything to be concerned about. And it will drop out as they start to learn. Uh, they might make errors on reflexive pronouns. Those are things like they'll say his self instead of himself. We wouldn't be concerned about that at that age. Or they'll make subject verb agreement errors. So they will say they was home instead of they were home, which would be normal at that age. They'll ask questions for logical information. They'll start to talk about their feelings. And they'll start using their imagination to make up stories using their language. Okay, now we're going to talk. Are there any questions about that before we move on to um, some ideas for helping your child learn to communicate? No? Okay. Um, <coughs> we're going to talk about speaking, listening, reading, playing, what to expect from your child, and um, giving them an opportunity to communicate. So your speech when you're talking to your child. Um, you try to, to speak at your child's level, but not use baby talk, although I think a little bit of baby talk is OK. If they have a word that's really special to them, I don't, you know, you guys all think it's really cute. I don't think there's any reason that you need to get rid of that word. It's just that you don't want to constantly talk in baby talk. But I did it a little bit myself with my children because, you know, that's something special about your child in a word and the way they made it up. Um, but you can talk using short phrases instead of really long sentences for them as they're developing. Talk about what you're doing. I am pounding a nail. And then emphasize one of the words, pound, pound, pound. And then you can repeat again, I am pounding a nail. So you're talking about what you're doing. They're learning the word pound. You can pick up the nail and show them and say the word nail to improve your vocabulary. Talk about what they are doing. You're running around the park. You're running, running, and then they're learning the word running. Expand on what your child says. So if your child looks at a baby and says cry, you can, you can say, Cry, you're right, cry, and you're real excited about the fact that they said that. But then expand a little bit for them. Say, baby crying, and then expand the sentence a little bit more. The baby is crying. And so now they're hearing it at their level, and then a little bit more advanced, and a little bit more advanced. And with older children, you just kind of take what they say 
and repeat it correctly. So further on, if they're leaving out a word from the sentence or they are using a verb tense or pronoun incorrectly, you don't want to correct them as much as you just want to let them hear the sentence said correctly. So you're excited about what they said, but then you repeat it back for them grammatically correctly, and they'll start to understand that way rather than um, being forced to repeat. It's also really important for the kids to learn good listening skills. They'll need that in school, and that's how they learn their language. So it's important to reduce a lot of the distractions, if possible, uh, when you're having a conversation with your child. Speak slowly and clearly at their level, and it's good to get down on their eye level if you can. Exaggerate the important words to keep their attention. Respond to what your child says so that they know that you are listening to them. Um, you can respond by making comments. Oops, I didn't turn. And um, with your facial expression, and if you're giving them eye contact, they know you're listening to them. And praise them for listening. Wow, I'm really proud of you. You're such a good listener, because listening is a very important skill that they'll need. Uh, reading is a good way to help your child develop language skills. Choose books at their interest level. Read new books while continuing to reread their favorites. You know, if they have a book that they want to read over and over again, um, that really is a good way for them to be learning their language. And you can just keep making more and more learning opportunities from that book. Make, make it a little bit more difficult each time for the pictures that they're going to point to or have them tell you a little bit more about the story. After reading the text, describe what's happening in the pictures in your own words um, at your child's level. For example, the Bernstein Bears books, I don't know if you read those to your kids very often, but they have a lot of text in there. And so the kids may love the book, but they might not get the whole paragraph that you just read. So, you know, after you've read it, then explain to the child what is going on in the picture. Or you can leave out the text completely, and you can just kind of tell them the story at their own level. And take, out, take the opportunity to point out new vocabulary words. Um, it's Halloween time, so, you know, black cat, whatever you might find in the books that you're looking at. And ask your child to talk about the pictures and tell you back the story. So you've read it to them, but now um, let them tell the story and use some of their words. Even if they can only use one word, it, flip through the pages and let them tell you one thing about it each page, and then see if you can get them to do two. Play is another great way um, to work on language. I just put a couple possibilities here. But you can do all kinds of things with um, play. You know, if you're looking in, a in the mirror with your child, um, point out the body parts, make some sounds, move your tongue or your lips and your cheeks and see if they can imitate and do what you're doing. Um, during ball play, encourage them to vocalize to get the ball. If they're not re yet ready yet to say the word ball, they um, can make a sound and they get the idea that they're controlling what's going on by the sound that they make. Um, if they're a little bit older, you can use some location words in put the ball under a table and say under, throw it up in the air and say up. Make the ball go fast, make the ball go slow. Pretend play, and we call that representational play a lot of the time. Um, teaching your child to pretend to do the see things they see you doing is a very important skill for language development. Um, they can f feed their doll, feed their baby, stir, cook, sweep, wash, mow, all the things that they see. Uh, your parent, their parents doing, and then work with them on the vocabulary that goes with that. Um, expect the best and no more. Um, you don't want to try to expect your child to do more than they're actually able to, or they might become frustrated with their 
attempts to communicate. If you know, if you were going to go out and run a marathon, the first thing you would do would not be to go out and run it. You'd probably st start by going for a walk, three blocks, four blocks, keep making it a little bit more difficult. You'd get frustrated if you were expected to run the whole thing the first day. Well, if you've never heard your child say the word cookie, then you can't necessarily expect them to say cookie to get a cookie. So you think a little bit about what they can say. Well, I've heard them say E, so maybe you can ask them to say E and then give them the cookie. And then you say, wow, I'm really excited. You said cookie. And they feel good about what they did, and they're going to be willing to try. You know, even if they, uh, they can't seem to say that E, you can just see if they can move their lips a little bit. Oh, you're getting ready to say cookie. So you have to take the level that they are able to be successful at and praise them for that. And then to try once you've praised them and they're pretty excited about that, then try to advance it a little bit further. So over time, then maybe they can say ee -e for cookie, uh e for cookie, and then ookie, and then finally cookie. So they started clear back there where they could just barely move their lips, but now they're all the way up to saying the whole word. Um, give them something to talk about. Create situations where your child needs to communicate something to you. If you're always anticipating what they might need, they don't need to talk to you. So um, when you're swinging your child, you can pull the swing back and hold it there and stop and um, see if you can get them to kind of move their back back to let you know that, oh, you want to go again. You want to go. Give them a chance. Then see if you can get them to move and then also um, maybe make a sound along with that. So it keeps getting a little, and then that sound goes all the way to O, oh, and then eventually the word go. Um, you can put one of your child's shoes on and not put the other one on. And then they're going to look at you, and then they have to try to communicate by gesturing, pointing, uh, uh, oh, you want your other shoe. Um, give everybody at the table a spoon and start eating, but don't give them one. You know, they're going to have to use their language to communicate to you that they want something. Sometimes, if they have an older sibling, they'll try to be the one to communicate that for them. So then you'll have to tell them, no, we're trying to let um, this child learn to communicate for themselves. Well, if you think that your child is not meeting the developmental milestones that they should, um, you might have concerns and you want to know, should I seek help? When you talk to your physician, you want to be really specific about what's going on with your child. If you, you might want to say, um, my child, if you say just my child is not talking, they may say, well, they'll, they'll move along. Let's see. Um, They'll get there. They don't really quite know what you're saying. But if you say, my child babbles a few consonant sounds but does not use any words, you're being much more specific with the doctor, then he'll have a little bit more idea whether to feel that your child is delayed. Uh, my child is talking, but no one in the family can understand him. Or my child was using 10 words, now they're only using three. Well, that would not be following the normal sequence of the development. However, if you told your doctor, well, my child is just using three words, they wouldn't realize that they had lost words. They might not think it was something to be as concerned about. Parents usually know. You know, you can kind of go with your gut. Whether it's you've had other children and you know that this child is just not developing their language skills the way your other children were, whether, wow, you know, they're understanding so much more than they're able to say. Um, they're missing several milestones. Um, they're deviating from the normal sequence of development. Um, they're repeating a long sentence that they hear um, on cartoons, but they're not saying mama. You know, that, that would be deviating from the normal sequence of development. 
Um, there's a big difference between their receptive and expressive skills. I go down this checklist, and boy, they're doing everything in the receptive side, but not much at all in the expressive or the other way around. Expressively, they're doing a lot, but boy, they just don't really seem to be able to process and remember what um, we would expect them to. So those are some guidelines. But it, it's very rare that we have a child that's referred to us for an evaluation that doesn't need help, I, very rarely. Once, twice a year, of all the kids that we see, do parents bring us a child to evaluate that it, doesn't need some speech therapy. Okay, okay. Um, where do you go for help? Well, speech therapy can be provided in several different settings. Um, the public schools do provide speech therapy for children. Um, there's a federal law that mandates intervention for children who have needs for between birth and three, well, between birth and 21. Um, and there's, there are early intervention services at each school district. So you can just call the main office of your school district and ask for the early intervention department. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Hospitals and clinics, you need to ask your physician for a prescription for a referral for communication evaluation. There are private speech-language pathologists that um, work out of their home and they often don't require a physician's prescription or um, the kinds of, children don't have to meet the kinds of guidelines that they do in the schools. Usually, the children who will go to these private pathologists did not qualify for school services. Their medical insurance did not cover speech therapy. And um, they're still looking for somewhere to go for help. I know several of these. Mostly these are girls who've worked in um, hospitals or schools, and they now are at home with their own children and want to do just a little bit of therapy on the side, and it works out well for everybody. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the school. They have services from birth to three. These services are usually provided on a homebound basis. They come into your home. Uh, to your child's natural environment. And activities are provided by the speech-language pathologist. Um, she'll sometimes interact directly with your child and sometimes instruct caregivers and family members on things that they can do specifically to help stimulate your child's language development. Between ages three and five, the services are usually provided by the speech-language pathologist in a preschool classroom setting. And it might be that she will pull the child out into her own classroom to work with them in a group, or um, she might work right in the classroom. There used to be, I'm gonna run out of question time here. There used to be specific language classrooms where all the children in the classroom ha were having difficulty with their speech and language, and they were usually taught by a speech pathologist and worked with those children directly. There are a few classrooms like that in the schools right now. However, um, the pendulum kind of swings back and forth for the types of services they provide, and um, there's been a big push for children to be able to be mainstreamed into a regular preschool classroom with the idea that they would learn these language skills by being provided a model or other children in the classroom who are using their language correctly. Um, so it might be that, that your child would be enrolled in a regular preschool classroom with peer models and then receive a little bit of speech therapy. Uh, after age five, kindergarten and up, um, the services are usually provided directly by the speech language pathologist either in the student's classroom or in the speech pathologist classroom. She might have a group of three or four second graders that she has come down to her room and work for them with them 20 minutes twice a week on their sounds. Or she might go directly into their classroom and work with them. Educational services need to be, for children to receive these services, they need to be evaluated by the speech pathologist and meet specific criteria 
that are set out by the federal government. And in Nebraska, we have Rule 51 that interprets that federal laws. And they need to be significantly below their peers in speech or language development in order to qualify for services if speech and language is their only handicapping condition. If they have other issues, other health impairments, they're being seen by the physical or occupational therapist, then um, the speech pathologist can provide services as a related service, or they can qualify as other health impaired if they have other health issues. But for a child who has no other issues other than delayed speech and language development, they need to be significantly below their peers on standardized tests. So it may not be that your child is not delayed. It would be that they are not delayed enough to qualify for the services that the school is providing. Medically-based services, which are provided either in a clinic or a hospital setting, are for birth, children birth to 21. Occasionally, they are provided on a homebound basis. Uh, through Some clinics will have uh, a home health section to their clinic where they can go out to your home. They are usually provided on a one-to-one -one basis for 30 to 60 minutes. And I didn't put this in here, but most of the kids that I see, I see once a week. A few of them I see twice a week. Very rare cases we would see children three times a week. Parents often observe the therapy session. Either they're in there in the same room with me, or um, we have some rooms with a two-way mirror and the parents are behind the mirror. Um, health insurance often covers speech therapy However, it's important to check with your insurance carrier about your child's specific diagnosis and ask whether they will cover speech therapy based on that diagnosis. Several insurance companies do not cover what they call delayed development. They will only cover services for children who had achieved skills and then lost them due to maybe um, a head trauma a brain tumor, some sort of an insult. So, but they will not cover services as the child is developing. Only services that, only skills that they have lost and have to redevelop. So that's something you have to um, talk with your insurance carrier about and um, the human resources department. And that's where these private speech therapists come in because it may be that um, your child is delayed but not delayed enough to um, receive services from the schools and they have no other handicapping conditions. Your insurance company does not cover developmental delays. And so you try to go another route. And um, these fees are usually private pay at a little bit at a reduced rate. And um, there are a few private speech therapists who are able to bill health insurance companies, but most of them. It's more like taking your child for tutoring for extra help, say in math, to a teacher. Well, this is taking your child to a speech pathologist for extra help in language. And um, speech therapy services here at Children's Hospital and Medical Center are a part of the Rehabilitation Services Department and are offered both here at the hospital and at our West Village Point locations. So, um, didn't give you guys a lot of time for questions, but do any of you have any questions? Or if you feel more comfortable, if you have questions you'd like to ask me afterwards, I'll be here if you want to ask uh, questions about your specific child that you don't feel comfortable asking in front of the group. I'm good with that, too. Any questions? OK, well, thank you for coming. and.